All right, we're live on YouTube. Okay, so um, today I have a few um, objectives. One is we're going to finish discussing from lectures three on um, the mathematical definition of a simplicial complex. And then I'm going to move on to examples of simplicial complex, specifically ribs complex and check complexes, which are then applied in the study of sensor networks. So we are going to move from theory to practice in today's lecture. And hopefully, if I have time, I want to go into a little bit detail over the data structure called union find, which is actually used to find connected components. Um, so some of you might have seen union find in algorithm classes. So, uh, so we'll leave that towards the end. All right, so let's start with a simplicial complexes. Remember what we started last uh, class is we're talking about separation. What is a topological space? What is the separation of topological space? Now we're going to move on to the definition of a simplicial complex. All right. So as I mentioned before, you've seen this picture. A zero simplex is a vertex. A one simplex is an edge. A two simplex is a triangle. A three simplex is a tetrahedra. And a four simplex, sometimes I can call it a five cell, depends on you know, the notion. But essentially, a k-dimensional simplex, what we learned before, contains k plus one vertices. Right. And if I'm using capital K, K of, well, let me not use K any longer. Let's use the letter P, a P dimensional complex contain P plus one simplex and K of P plus one are all the edges of the simplex. Okay. So remember what is K of P plus one is the complete graph. So basically it means for every single pair of vertices, there's an edge between them. And that edge, those edges, you know, are sort of at the boundary of the P simplex, okay? So what is the mathematical definition? A K simplex, here K means the dimension is a convex hull of k plus one of finding independent points. So what is a convex hull, right? So if I start with points, let's say for the time being, let's say k is equal to two. So we are studying two simplex, okay? And we know that a two simplex is a triangle, okay? So in this case, my a fine independent points is going to be u0, u1, and u2, okay? And they are a finally independent if only if, in this case, when k is equal to two, so I have three points. So we want to say every two points, they are linearly independent. So what is an example of a fine independent points. So let me just add a page here. If I have three points in some sense on, in say, let's say in 2D, they are sort of in general position. Then the vector connecting each pair of them, they are independent from each other. And then not a fine independence is that if they all lie on the same line, then this is not a fine independence. Of course, in, from a geometric perspective, yes, if you have collinear points, you are not going to create a triangle when you compute the convex hull. So how do you understand convex hull? The, the classic thing is it's like you have the points and you put a rubber band surrounding it. So in this case, you know, if I have k is equal to two, then we are looking at two simplex, which contains three points and Another property is that let's say I have points u0, u1, u2, then the what is inside is what's called a fine combination, or it is a fine combination if it's a linear combination of all the points uh, with weights, okay? With weights. So basically, if I take a point inside, remember this whole triangle, including the interior, is my two simplex. And if I put a pick a point in here that is x, 
x is in some form of linear combination. So it's going to be, I'm using lambda, so it's going to be lambda zero, u zero plus lambda one, u one plus lambda two, u two, except u two is actually one minus lambda zero minus lambda one and u two, okay? And of course, if I assume both lambda one, lambda zero are a bigger or equal to zero, this is what's called, it's a convex combination. So the definition is, right? The definition is that if I have, again, if I just have two points, well, if I just have one single point, this is what I call our simplex, then yes, then this, you know, everything in this point, which is itself is one times itself. So it is a convex combination of all its vertices. Now, if I talk about a one simplex and I have two vertices, then the edge I just drew, any point along this edge is a convex combination of u, u0, uh, u0, u1, which is basically x is equal to lambda 0 u0 plus 1 minus lambda 0 u1. This is very much aligned well, well with your intuition of a point in the middle between two points. You know, it's a linear combination uh, between those two points. And then this is a, this is example of a two simplex where again, every single point inside, in, inside and also along the boundary is either here or here. They are all linear, com a convex combination of its, uh, of its uh, vertices. And then finally, let's look at the last example, which is a three simplex, which is a tetrahedra. You have to be careful whenever we talk about simplex, it's not only includes boundary, but also its interior. So basically the two simplex is a triangle that include the surface area of the triangle where a tetrahedra is going to include this solid thing in the middle, right? So this is a, you know, think about this as a solid piece. So if I take any point X, which is supposed to be in this part of the solid piece, this point or every point in here is a linear combination of, or a convex combination specifically, of um, its vertices, all right? So that is the definition of a simplex, okay? Any questions? All right, so, so now we have the definition of a face, okay? And a coface and a proper face, okay? So the definition is that if sigma is a sort of a simplex, a face of it is to solve a complex, a convex whole of a non-empty subset of it. Um, and then the bigger one is a coface and then it's the face is proper if it's strictly smaller. So this is all very abstract. Let's just look at the example in the case of a triangle. If this is my triangle and my simplex, I call this simplex sigma, it can be represented as a collection of, of its vertices. So when I write it like that, it's just to say that my sigma is a convex combination of its vertices. Okay, now the face, if I want to generate what are the face of sigma. So the first, and when they say it's a face, usually we say, you know, it's another simplex where when I say it's a face, I say it's, I use this symbol to declare it's a face. And I mean, it's, you know, it's, you can call it less or equal to, but really the symbol here represent it's a face of it. So what is the face of it? For example, itself is a face of it. So, okay. 
And now, if I remove each one of the vertex and look at what's remaining, if I remove the first vertex, what's remaining is U1, U2. And uh, if, I remaining, uh, if I remove U1, what I have is U0, U2. And if I remove U2, what I have is uh, U0, U1. And if I remove a pair of them, then I always get singletons. Okay, so what does this mean? All this are faces of it, which is basically saying that, okay, what is a face of a triangle? It's the triangle itself. And then it's all its individual edges. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also the individual vertices. Those are all faces of the triangle. All right. And then anything that is not the triangle, all, among all those faces, the ones I put here is all the vertices and edges are what's considered a proper face because they are strictly smaller than the faces, than the sigma itself, all right? Now the question is what's a face of a tetrahedra? Or another way to think about it is what is on the boundary of this thing, okay? So I'm just going to simplify my notation, just one, two, three, four, so it's faster for me to write. The tetrahedra itself is a convex combination of one, two, three, four, then what is face? Well, of course, sigma itself is a face and all the triangles. So all the triangle zero, one, two, one, two, three, of course they are all solid. And um, zero, two, three, which is a bottom face. And then zero, Oh, zero, one, three, which is the back face. Okay, so all those triangles is not its face and all the edges, right? Zero, one, zero, two. So there's basically six edges, four triangles, and then four vertices. You know, one, zero, one, two, three. Those are all faces of it. And of course, everything except for sigma itself is a proper face because it's smaller. So one way to think about it is I'm sort of taking the boundary of, um, of those uh, simplex and also looking at the boundary of boundary. So those are important later when we talk about homology. But this is really what's the definition of a face. And now when sigma, when tau is a face, of sigma, then sigma is a co-face of tau. It's just a duality. When tau is a face of sigma, sigma is a co-face of tau. That's it. Oh, by the way, I should use this. Okay. So that's that. And then finally, there's a definition of a simplicial complex. A simplicial complex is a finite collection of simplices such that whenever a simplex sigma is in the simplicial complex, then all its faces is in the simplicial complex. So that is the first condition. Whenever a sigma is in the simplicial complex, its faces has to be in there, right? Remember each of the face is a convex combination of a subset of its vertices. And the second condition is that if I have two simplex in the simplicial complex, their intersection is either empty or a face of both. Okay, so let's first look at the first condition. A simplicial complex, let's say, what is a simplicial complex that I'm visualizing here with vertex one, two, and three? The simplicial complex, in this case, the K, is going to contain, first of all, is going to contain the triangle one, two, three. But then because the triangle is in there, then all its faces has to be in there. 
which means one, two, the edge has to be there. One, two, one, three, two, three. Okay. And one is also its face. Two is also its face. And three is always face. Okay. So basically the triangle is here, the edges is here, and then the vertex is here. I'm just using those as a symbol to correspond to it. And then let's double check that because the edges is already in there, then the face of the edge, which is a vertex, it has to be in there. So this is now complete. This entire simplicial complex, when I visualize it on the left-hand side, is include all the vertices, all the edges, and then this, that single triangle. If I give another example, okay, let's give another example. This is a my visualization. of my simplicial complex K. We can now list or the simplices across dimension, okay? So let's start from the lowest dimension. So what is a zero simplex that is in K, which is basically vertices? Anyone? Zero, two, five. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Well, technically I should put these things here, but I'm just going to be lazy, right? Basically, you know that we're going to enumerate all the vertices. What about one simplex in here? All the edges? Yes, all the edges, right? So uh, 0, 5, 0, 4. Literally, they should be written this way. Um, but I'm going to simplify it. So 0, 3, 3, 4. One, two, two, three, and one, three. Yeah. And now what's a two simplex? The faces or the triangles. Sorry. How many are there? The two triangles. Two triangles. Yeah. There's only one. This is this this means shading. This one is not shaded, so it's not a triangle. It's just the skeleton. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's only one, two, and three. So now you check, this is a simplicial complex in the sense that it satisfies the first condition. Whenever a simplex is in there, all its faces has to be in there, right? So that's the thing, right? If I, if I remove any of those simplex, the remaining is no longer a simplicial complex. It has this really nice property. Sometimes we call it the closure property. That closure property is precisely whenever a simplex is in there, all its faces has to be in there. That is a closure property. So whenever I take this boundary operation, the results is always in the same set. That's why it's called closure. But there's a second condition. Second condition is whenever I have two simplex, whenever they have the, inter if we compute their intersection, the intersection is either empty or a face of both. What do I mean by that? Let me go through this example. If I focus on this yellow edge, versus say this triangle, right? What is there in their intersection? What is intersection between the edge three, four intersect the triangle one, two, three? Vertex number three. Vertex three. Yeah, exactly. It's a vertex three, right? So three is a simplex, right? And it's a, it's a face of both of them, okay? So, and then of course, if I have this pink, See, I have a pink edge. Now, if I take the pink edge intersect with the yellow edge, what is in the intersection? Empty. Empty, right? So intersection is either empty or face of both. So what does this prevent me from happening is it's to prevent Mm, let me be a little bit careful because I need to, I want to draw it, but I also don't want this to be part of this. Oh yeah, this is perfectly fine. Right, this is actually some sort of degenerate case. There's multiple things wrong about this picture, right? Let's say those are all triangles, okay? So there's two things that's 
uh, weird about it. <laughs> first of all, this is actually not a simplex in the first place. And then second of all, the intersection, which is this point, it's a face to the right hand side, but it's not a face to the left hand side. Okay, so it's kind of the second condition is sort of prevent. Oh, actually, here's another example. It's prevent your triangle intersect in a weird way. All right, so that was sort of it prevents the simplices intersect in the interior of the simplex. Whenever they intersect, they have to intersect over their boundary. Mm. See what I mean? So this picture, I really want to color it. So this is one triangle. This is another triangle. And this picture is not allowed. It's not a simple show complex. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so that's our definition of a simplicial complex. The next thing we're going to define is what's called um, the Czech complex and uh, via Torres Rips complex. Sometimes people denote this as a VR complex or it, it's denoted as a Rips complex, depends on how you pronounce. So it's really technically should be via Torres Rips because it's invented by two people. Or it's related to people's, yeah. All right, so this is where I'm going to do a small perturbation of my content. I'm going to go explain those um, simplices first, okay? Oh, before I go in there, remember I said there is a definition from lecture three. If we recall the definition, it's a definition of what is a topology. And there is this technical definition so remember the topology, it says uh, intersection of a finite number. So what I highlight in yellow, the intersection of a finite number of member have to belong to the set. That's, so the, there is this technical definition, why do I have to be finite? So hopefully you have spent some time thinking about it. One of the reason is that you know, why is topology require a finite number of set intersection, not an infinite number? So if you think about this, if I'm talking about a topology on the real line, okay, and then the element there, the open set, there are actually open intervals. And then I'm going to take a set intersection where the set is one, it's minus one over n plus one over n, okay? And now, Instead of asking for finite number of intersection, I'm going to look at infinite number of intersections. So n goes to infinity. So what I'm computing is I'm computing, let's say n is equal to uh, one. So it's minus one to one. n is equal to two minus one half, one half. n is equal to three. This is intersection, sorry. This symbol is intersection. One over three, uh, one minus three and so on. But it goes to infinity, okay? So what's happening when you take those infinite number of intersection in this particular case, what's in the intersection in the infinity is a single point zero. And that single point zero is no longer an open interval, right? So those, those are sort of pathological scenarios that if you don't put this finite intersection, you no longer have a well-defined thing called what is a topology. So this particular example give you a justification why we require a finite number of set intersection. Because if, if any of those times when you don't go to infinity, your intersection of those interval is still an interval, an open interval, okay? All right, that's just a sidetrack over this. So check and Rips complex. Let's start with Rips complex, okay? It's defined over a point cloud in high dimensional space, but my picture is showing that it's, I'm drawing it in two dimensions. So intuitively, let's say I start with a point in two dimensional space as I pictured here, right? So the definition of Rips complex is very simple. It's just to say there is a simplex, sigma, in the ribs complex of radius r, whenever the pairwise distances between them in this simplex is at most 2r. So let's say r is a radius that grows along each points. 
essentially there's an edge that's going to show up when those disks intersect. Okay, so that's the first condition. So for example, I have two points P and Q. That is my current point cloud. And at the current radius R, when their pairwise distances is less or equal to two times the radius, this really means that the disk of radius R intersect. So whenever the disk intersect, there is an edge between them, right? So this is like say two-way intersection, there's an edge. And now the middle picture is my point cloud is a three points. And then this, this radius, there is a sway three-way intersection. This area is an intersection area. Whenever I have a sway three, oh, three, let me, oh, let me put it this way. So it's not a three-way intersection. This is actually not three-way because, hold on, let me just look at the picture carefully. Oh, this is a three-way intersection, fine. Whenever there is a three-way intersection, there's obviously a triangle, but what most in important is for ribs, whenever I have three point, let's say P, Q, and let's say this point is V, I have a pairwise intersection between them. This is actually really for every single point, pair of points in my simplex. Whenever there's a pairwise intersection, there's a pairwise intersection, there's a pairwise intersection, I will put the simplex a triangle in there. So it's only a pairwise intersection. You see what I mean? So if I have a collection of points in my um, simplex sigma, whenever for every pair of points in my simplex, if they are within distance two R from each other, then of course there's the edge, but then I also add the entire simplex in there. Okay, so of course, if there's three-way intersection, it also implies there's a two-way intersection, so the triangle is in there. The difference between this and check complex is that check asks for higher order intersection. So whenever there's a pairwise intersection, okay, that's a uh, that's an edge. But then if there's the only pairwise intersection, but not three-way intersection, you do not add a triangle. You only add a triangle when you have a three-way intersection. So this area is actually where the disks intersect. So the definition for a check is, you know, I give a point cloud P and I give a radius R. It's all the, it contains all the simplices, well, what we call subsets, whose corresponding sets of R balls have non-empty intersections. So that means for every single point in my simplex, there you, the intersection of all the balls have to have uh, non-empty intersection. So what does this imply? This implies that the only time I have a tetrahedra is if I have a four-way intersection of the balls. Like all four of them have to have common intersection, okay? So the difference between check and ribs is whenever I, I want to put a simplex in there, as long as I have a pairwise intersection among my uh, uh, disks surrounding my um, uh, points. And then check is whenever I have, um, you know, a higher order intersection, that's where the simplices show up. So if you compare the two pictures, especially this picture is that in check, if you only have pairwise intersection, I don't have the simplex. But in ribs, whenever there's a pairwise intersection, I will have the simplex in there. Okay. So um, I think this is a time to for a five minutes biological break, and uh, we'll be back in uh, five minutes. But if you feel like it, you can now click on this. Well, this click doesn't work. Copy. You can play with a demo of this. This is slightly more complicated. You can reduce the radius of uncertainty. So now this is a disk scenario and you can change the radius here. I'm using my hand, so it's a little bit tricky, but then you can play with showing the, um, showing the nodes and showing the edges and showing the face, okay? And then now you can switch between check and ribs. But anyway, um, let's take a quick break and we'll be back in, uh, you know, 
five minutes. So 9.49. All right, so let's resume um, the lecture. So as I said, this is actually um, a, a software developed by my former student, Tim. Um, and it's actually a study of sort of sensors, uh, sensor networks 
when there's some sort of uh, uh, uncertainty associated with the coverage radius and location of the sensors. But for the time being, we're just looking at, you know, where there's no uncertainty. So think about each dot or each point in this domain as a location of the sensor. And then the disk, which is a radius, uh, is where it's, it's coverage. So you can, you know, sort of change, uh, you can change the radius of it, which increase or decrease the sensor. But what's interesting is now I would like to study what is the difference between ribs and, and, and check complex. For example, I can, you know, like I said, you start with some radius, right? The check and both check and ribs complex is defined with some radius parameter. So what I'm showing here is as I increase the radius, how does my corresponding ribs complex change as, in, as a radius increase, right? So at a very small radius, I have all the disks not intersecting with each other, then my underlying um, ribs complex just contain all those points. Now, if I increase it ever slightly, like here, at this radius, all of a sudden there's two, two pairs of disks that intersect. Remember, whenever there's a pairwise intersection, an edge will show up. So now two edges is added to my simplicial complex, which is a ribs complex. Now, if I increase it further, you know, at this radius, may I do a little bit? Okay, again, another edge showed up. And next thing it's happened, oh, I'm doing too much. Right here is where I want to be. So at this level, you see that I have, again, whenever there's a pairwise, well, actually this is all three-way intersection already. Let me just do it a little bit. A little bit tricky. Let me see if uh, if I'm successful. Yes, I'm successful in this case. Remember, I'm looking at ribs complex. So what happened is actually the triangle showed up when there's only pairwise intersection. Now at this stage, if I switch to check complex, that triangle isn't there because if you actually zoom in into that area, there is a small tiny gap in the middle, which means that all those three disks that form a triangle in the ribs complex do not intersect in a three-way intersection. So that's why when you switch between check, which is does not have a triangle. So in this case, the check complex is one vertex plus a bunch of edges and that's it. There's no triangle in there. But then when you switch to ribs, you have a triangle because whenever there's a pairwise intersection um, goes on, but now I can do it further, right? And I, as I increase my radius, I'm just doing it over my mouse. You can see how in the check scenario, more and more triangles are gonna show up and, and so on and so forth, okay? And then you can do this as maybe the whole region is covered, okay? So this is also a notion of how you think about coverage, especially in the check scenario. So again, think about each of this node as where the sensor is. And then as, so this is a scenario where the sensor are, uh, are, are, are static, meaning that their location is fixed, right? So as I'm increasing, think about now I have an intruder, right? So let's say this, those sensors are some sort of uh, motion sensors, whatever, right? In a, in, a, in a house, okay? And I have an intruder coming into the house. So the motion sensor is going to have a range. And for simplicity, I'm going to model the range as if it's a disk surrounding it. And the range is a radius. So if you have motion sensor with small uh, coverage radius, then the intruder can be any empty spaces. As long as there's a no disk, you will not know that there's an intruder, right? So then one way to kind of to add more security to your house is to upgrade your sensor to have more uh, more uh, range, so have a larger covers co uh, coverage. So you can see that as I increase my radius again, right? And for example, in this case, oh, I want to do th this is check. Remember, because I want this to cover. If I go a little bit, oh, I am trying to get there. Very, it's my mouse is not okay. Right here. Yeah. So in this case, well, of course, if the intruder is in all this white space, you cannot detect him. Okay. But also, 
remember there's no three-way intersection. That means where this triangle is, where the triangle, what, where there's no triangle, but there's a three edges kind of have a pairwise intersection. If the intruder is standing right in the middle of the hole, none of the sensor will notice it, right? So in some sense, in this case, whenever there's a essentially a tunnel or a hole in my domain, this is where intruder can be. But then as I increase it, the radius further and further, my intruder is going to have less and less of a place where they can hide, which is they have to hide in empty spaces. And of course, once your radius is at this level, you know you have complete coverage, okay? So that's actually the relation between homology with respect to sensor coverage is whenever you have, you know, um, whenever you have empty or loops in the space or so empty spaces, you basically have, um, no coverage. So let me just create a very simple example, right? This is a very more typical example. Let's say this is an example, okay? So what's going to happen in this case is that as I increase my radius, more and more edges shows up. And, and again, in this case, if my intruder is really in the white space, the tunnel in the middle, you are not going to detect the intruder but then as I increase further, as I increase the radius, remember now I'm doing check. So there's now a three-way intersection. So the triangle shows up, more three-way intersection and so on. And eventually, right? The entire section in the middle is completely covered. So, you know, at this radius, there's no intruder can exist in the middle of the domain. Okay. so. This also looks familiar, if you recall, when I describe persistent homology, right? Remember I said persistent homology is I have started with a set of points. As I increase the points, I'm looking at the, the disappearances of components when things merge, right? Here I have, how many points do I have? I have nine points, so I have a nine component. As I increase, nine component, nine component, now there is eight component because two of the disks merge, you know, and then I have, you know, now in this radius, I have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five component and one component. And now the one component stays, it lives forever. At this radius, I have a loop, right? And then this loop is born roughly around this radius and it disappears at this radius. Ooh. Yeah, okay. So now persistent homology is really going through this process. So now you see the connection between my check complex or my ribs complex. It keeps track of the, the appearance and disappearances of component and loops and voids and so on, it can, be done through the evolution of the simplicial complex. And that's why I say you compute persistent homologies through the evolution of those uh, simplicial complex, right? So that is a connection, okay? And you can, you can play with this to get a more intuition over what it is. And then of course, this particular research project is that, you know, instead of, um, is instead of studying a sensor that is um, certain of its coverage, I also have a, a radius of uncertainty. So what is the radius of uncertainty is that sort of my coverage is not a fixed radius, but there's like a radius plus some epsilon where, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not, you know, it, that range is sort of like the uncertain region. Maybe you can consider that's where the range where sometimes the sensor works, sometimes it doesn't work. And also you can also have you know, potential locations per sensor. So the location of the sensor is somehow dis uh, coming from a distribution. So this is where, when you study sort of the sensor coverage problem, you know, the coverage, meaning that I want to detect intruder, um, 
when you study those problems, you can inject some uncertainty in the data and, and try to model it also using some social complexes, except that you need to take, um, be more careful how you do the modeling process because you know the disk has sort of like a range of radius where the sensor might be effective. All right, so that is a high level picture. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, I had yeah. a question. Uh, yeah. So is there like a theoretical reasoning why, like for check, for instance, why a triangle is formed when you have like a three-way intersection and for rips there, there isn't like- Yeah, so, so this is exactly what's coming up. So, um, so the, the, the design of those has a lot to do. So the check complex have what's called a nerve lemma. Okay. And then this has to do with uh, sort of a homotopy uh, theory and it's a little bit complicated, but let's um, let me go over the first motivation why we need those. Let me, let me sort of answer it in the application sense. And then later on, we're going to go into the more theoretical sense. Okay. Like I said, on the high level, the theoretical sense is that the check complex has actually has a very nice property is because if you look at the picture, whenever the sort of the homology of the union of this disk is the same homology of the underlying sim sim simplicial complex. So essentially in this particular example, right? If I have, if I want to compute I want to draw something that is pairwise intersection, sorry. <laughs> if I want to compute the union of those disks, okay? Or maybe if I just do, yeah, I should have, I should just go to this example here, okay? So let's see. Uh, let me just start with random data and I'm going to do. I want to do this example here, okay? So when you, what I visualize here is a check, okay? What you see in this example is that if I want to detect the homology of the union of the disks, okay? This one has one loop. So Betty one is one, so it has one loop, okay? It turns out if you're using check complex that the, if you compute how many loops are there for the check complex, which is now a collection of points and collection of edges, they are identical, right? So in a sense that if I use check complex, I can compute the homology of the union of both at the same, the homology of the union of both is the same as a homology of my simplicial complex, right? So the, if I just focus on the edge, so I don't show the, show the, I don't show the, coverage. So if I just compute the homology of this thing, it says it has a loop. And that's identical to the homology of the union of both. You see what I mean? So that is a nice property of, of check complex. And theoretically, this is called the, sort of the, the nerve lemma, which will show up later. Um, but that's nice thing about check complex. However, the drawback of check complex it's, it's computationally expensive when you have a large set of points. Because how do you compute it naively? In order for me to have, remember, in order for me to have a triangle, I need to have a three-way intersection. In order for me to have a tetrahedra, I need to have a four-way intersection, which means among my n points, I need to do n choose three to check all those combinations to see whether there's a triangle among any three vertices. And then is there a triangle among every, is there a tetrahedra among every four uh, vertices, which is n choose four. So the naive computation of the check complex is going to be n choose two plus n choose three plus n choose four up onto the dimension of the simplicial complex you care about. So it actually grows really fast and become really expensive to compute, especially I want to decide on sensor network. On the other hand, the ribs complex is easy to compute because you first say, okay, all the vertices is already there. The edges is a pairwise intersection, but remember there's always going to be a triangle when there's three pairwise intersections. 
right? So the only way I can just decide whether there's a triangle is to check essentially it became somewhat of a lookup table. As long as you have a pairwise um, sort of deciding on particular radius, whether there's a pairwise intersection, which boil down to the pairwise distances. As long as you have a pairwise distance lookup, you can check for a particular triangle whether it exists by looking at its edges, whether those edges exist. Whenever the edges exist, the triangle exists, right? So the only computation I need is really to compute pairwise intersection. And everything else is to say, you know, there's a tetrahedron if all its pairs of edges exist, right? So it's actually become faster to compute the Ribs complex. That's one of the major usage of Ribs complex. It's, it's, um, um, it's faster to compute. However, Ribs complex computationally also has its drawback is that if you look at this example, just focus on picture, right, on the bottom, going from this picture to this picture, the difference is that the Ribs complex can be a lot larger than the check complex, right? Because remember, under the same point cloud, there's only a simplex that will show up when there is a k-way intersection for check, but ribs is going to have this triangle already fairly earlier. So the drawback of the ribs complex, it's faster to compute, but it's turned to be larger versus the check. It's slower to compute, but it recovers the homology uh, sort of accurately, right? So why I say it recovers the homology accurately is that if I want to really study the coverage problem, I really need the check complex because in the example I highlighted in yellow, this is a situation that I don't have coverage because I have this tightly little piece where my intruder can stand and there's still a hole in there. But if I'm using ribs complex, there's no such hole. So ribs complex isn't sort of perfect in doing things like coverage detection. See what I mean, right? So. How do you use in practice? In practice, we usually use ribs complex when there is a really large uh, point cloud because otherwise the computation is uh, too expensive to even compute the check complex. However, the drawback is now I have a really large simplicial complex to deal with, for example, to compute persistent homology. So there's a lot of existing techniques to try to deal with those large simplicial complexes, a lot of them is coming from ribs complex. So you see the drawback and advantage for each one of them, okay? But how do you actually solve in sensor problem? People actually solve this in sensor problem, which is what we're going to go into detail now. So in sensor network, remember this example I showed, right? If I do check complex, the thing on the right is a check complex, the thing on the left is the union of balls. It turns out that the union, if I want to detect homology, that the union, the homology of the union ball on the left is the same homology of the check complex on the right. So in some sense, if I want to study sensor coverage, which is, you know, in 2D, it's boiled down to detecting um, sort of loops that I should use check complex to get an accurate computation. And what's interesting about it is that, so this is exactly the problem with Ribs complex is that it would detect what's called a phantom topological feature. So what is the phantom topological feature? On the left-hand side, there's no coverage because I have this tiny little area where there's actually still a loop. But because of the definition of the Torres Ribs complexes, because there's like pairwise intersections, so the simplex actually cover it up completely. So in this case, you know, I will somehow tell you, oh, you have coverage using computation of risk, but in, but in reality, there is still an area that is not covered. So in a sense that if I'm talking about Betty number, Betty number of sort of the union of those balls, right? At radius R, the, the homology, the homology of the union of those balls is equal to one versus the homology of this simple, this check of uh, this ribs complex is zero, sorry, right? So there's a mismatch between this. So how do you solve that? It turns out there's theoretical results to use ribs complex to approximate check complex. And the trick is to by studying the inclusion of ribs and check. 
it turns out that the ribs complex at radius r is a subset of the check complex when the radius is square root of two over r. All right. So this is a precise. Um, this, this is actually a precise relation. What does this really mean? It says, okay, right. You know that when growing the radius, some and, and I'm looking at the growth of the underlying simplicial complex. In ribs, some of the simplices is going to show up earlier than the check complex, right? But eventually, they are going to show up as if it's a check complex as my radius is big enough. So in other way that because of the subset relation, you know that you know, in, in order for you for me to approximate the check, I know this precise relation that you know a check complex at a larger radius is going to include a ribs complex at a smaller radius. Okay, so that's the first theoretical results that's there. But the most important one is not only I have this one way one way inclusion, I also have a nesting relationship, right? The first lemma is saying that the ribs is a, at the lower radius is a subset of a check at a higher radius. But now what's here here is to say the first relation is actually easier to understand the check at a radius r is a subset of the ribs at the same radius r, right? Because of this, of course, sorry, let me be careful. This is when my, yeah. So, so this constant, sorry, this constant here changes with respect to dimension. Okay. So if my, if my n is equal to two, then this constant is bigger or equal to two times three when my constant equal to three this sigma is over equal to six over four and so on and so forth right so why is this case first of all as you increase the dimension you know in in two dimension you are talking about disks growing in three dimension you're talking about balls growing and in high dimension you're talking about those high dimension balls growing so this constant basically changes with respect to the dimension but the really interesting results because of this, okay, what people have shown theoretically, because that a ribs complex is nested between check complexes of different diameters, then you can use persistence homology to try to detect the, um, the true coverage uh, uh, situation. Uh, using ribs as a detection. What we do is to say, I'm going to compute ribs complexes within two parameters. And then the check complex homology is going to be the homology of the ribs complex between the range of parameter where the hom as long as the homology persists in that range of values, then corresponding check complex have have the right homology. So um, let me see if I have the results. Actually, I might ha not have included. I will include at the beginning of next semester of the exactly mathematical definition. But all that is saying is that if I want to re use ribs complex to detect the homology of the corresponding check, I cannot do ribs complex as a fixed radius. But instead, I'm going to compute ribs complex at two different radius such that when I go from one radius to the next radius, I'm looking at what homology, so what tunnel especially, still persists in that range. As long as that homology persists in that range, my corresponding check complex has the same homology. So let me try to explain this by animation. So, so the idea is now I'm computing everything using ribs complex. But I'm not going to compute the ribs complex at a at a single fixed radius. I'm going to compute ribs complex at you know a range of radius, and I'm going to look at in this range of radius what are the homologies that is still there. So example is that for example now what I'm showing is a ribs complex. So what I have is to say okay I'm going to compute the homology at this radius for the ribs complex. Okay, and I'm going to also compute homology at a little bit higher radius 
at here, okay? So as I increase, I can also um, change my, not showing the coverage, okay? So I compute my homology over my ribs complex at some radius, and I increase my radius at a, at a later radius, like here, for example. And I see that as I go from the first radius to the second radius, this tunnel is always there, meaning that this tunnel leaves through this whole range of parameters, okay? Why do this? Theoretically, it means that in between, there is a check complex at a radius in between, which have exactly the same homology as the ribs complex. So, so basically in practice, when you compute with a carefully selected range of radius of the ribs complex, that can be used to approximate the homology of the corresponding check complex of a radius in between. So that is what at the key point of why you want to rip, use RIPS. In practice, RIPS is faster to compute, but it's bigger. So you need to deal with essentially large data. But then if you compute RIPS complex at a range of radius, that information contained in that range, which is captured by persistent homology, is, can be used to approximate the homology of the check complex. And then you are done. So you kind of avoid computing check complex completely in practice by just computing ribs complex at a range of radius. So that's what it means, okay? All right, so that's that for the two. But now the next thing is actually the, sense, the notion of time varying sensor network. So, um, you know, one thing is if let's say your sensors is sort of not static, okay? The sensors can move around, which means that, you know, this is, this is basically time. And what you showed here, underneath here, the dots are the location of the sensor. And then let's say the, the edges, the, all these edges are sort of, and triangles are essentially sort of my simplicial complex. So the question is that if I have a time varying sensor network where for one example of a time variant sensor network is when the sensors move around. So what turns out is that if you want to achieve coverage, right, you can achieve coverage with a small number of sensors, um, but the sensors are moving, okay? So a good example, if you watch one of those mobster movies and then they have people guarding, the, uh, guarding their mansion, right? Those, those guards don't stay still, they move around, right? What is the reason? It's because if you have, you know, those sensors moving around, you can achieve coverage with a smaller number of guards, right? So, so then of course, when you watch a spy movie, how you invade the house is they, they kind of remember what is at the time where there's a gap and then they kind of understand how the, what is the schedule of the, the guards to figure out, you know, there's a particular path you can take where you avoid the guard, you avoid the guard, right? So that is exactly a sensor coverage problem over time. So as a sensor moving around, you know that there is always potentially a hole somewhere where the intruder can stand in there. And as the sensor move around as, the, as, the, as long as the intruder always stays, in a time involving hole in the sensor coverage problem, it can avoid detection. You see what I mean? But if I were going to model it, it actually becomes something like this. In this example, right? Let's say at some point there is an area where inside that area there's no sensor coverage. And now in the next time frame, there's another area, and this area changes. So as long as you know, again, the this axis is time. So as long as sort of the intruder stay in this tube, it can avoid detection. But the problem is, as if you encode somewhere, let's say I keep going through this tube, I keep going through this tube, but if at some point in time that this tube terminate, meaning that as long as there's any time point in here, where the tube no longer exists, then you have no coverage in the same time span because it basically means at that time step you are, you are detected. So the way to model this kind of problem is actually you model the 
the R2 times R. So you model everything in three space. So three dimensional Euclidean space where you basically study, sometimes I call them like pair of pants. You know, all these tubes are potential places where an intruder can stay, but then you get this weird configuration. Let me just draw it from left to right. This is time. You can get this weird You can get this weird configuration, right? Remember, I'm drawing the tube where um, where the intruder could potentially be, right? So now this is a really a question for you, which I want you to take home. Can you convince yourself in this configuration, right? Remember, time goes from left to right, and then what I drew as those those are the empty spaces at every time point. Okay. Can you convince yourself whether you can have intruder or not in this case? Okay. Homologically speaking, you still have a tube, but whether this is achievable in reality is a good question. Okay. So back to sensor coverage. So there's a lot of variations. I mean, this work is more than you know more than a decade old, but the idea is at every single time step you can detect the loop. Or tunnel in that time step, and then you can track how those how those sort of tunnel involve by looking through a tube, and then you know study the configuration of this three dimensional space by studying those tubes, and that will tell you whether you achieve coverage over time. Okay, so of course obvious examples when you have coverage is is uh, is the picture I was trying to draw earlier. The obvious example where you you have coverage is you have some tube but that tube end at some point. And then you still have some other tube and, and so on and so forth. As long as you don't, so when you have this, when you actually compute homology in this case, right? Remember this is a volume. This is a three dimensional volume, okay? When you have situations like this where the, the tube begin here ends here, this give me a two dimensional void, okay? But in sensor, sensor network, this is not good, right? Because there's no way for your intruder to get into this void in the first place. And also in this case, let's say it start with a tube, but then this tube kind of end. And then this is a situation where you don't really have a void because remember, this is really like a bow, right? So you really don't have, uh, you don't have one dimensional homology. So the whole space, the beta one is actually zero. You don't have any tunnels. So the one of the condition is you, you have to have some form of tunnel that goes through from beginning to the end over time. If I do this, this configuration give me at least one tunnel, right? But that may not be enough because if you look at this example, I still have a tunnel go through, but is this realizable over time? That's a different question. Right? So somehow you have to think about this. This somehow require some form of um, jumping over space in order to realize this over time, okay? All right, so for the last several minutes, I'm just going to go over a quick um, high level picture of something called uh, union find. So how many of you have heard of union find? If you can raise your hand. Okay, so I think some of you has exposure. So this is a quick review of it. So the union find is basically on the high level. Um, it's used for finding connected components essentially. But on the high level, if you have a set of elements and then they're partitioned into sets, you basically want to keep track of the connectivity of each element in the set, right? And um, they, it's, it's, it's a very efficient data structure. So it has a long history go dating back to 1960s. Um, but one of the, another way to call it, sometimes people also call it disjoint set data structure. And it's really used to track the set of elements as they're partitioning into a number of disjoint subsets. And then in sort of representation, usually the elements are represented almost like a tree. So think about whenever, you know, if this is a physical, oh, I should have gotten the, the grapes. I used to bring grapes to this class when I teach union find. 
is that really like you have sort of a tree has a root, another tree has a root. And then when you kind of thinking about all the operations that is important to union find, um, they're really corresponding to kind of tracing the parent, uh, you know, of the grape, whatever. So, so I'm hoping that next time you eat grape that you're thinking about union find data structure. So there's three operations in there. Number one is if I have a single element, I'm going to make it into a set containing that single element. That is a make set operation. I also have a find operation, which is to try to find the root of the tree that contains a particular element, right? And then union is to say that if you have a tree that contains X, you want to make the root of the tree contain X to also be the root of the tree contain the other node Y. So this is a situation where you take two clusters of grape and you try to glue them into one single, uh, one single component. Okay. So for example, um, there is a slightly different perspective in over uh, union find from the perspective of social network. Okay. So for example, if let's say my social network, my social network is small, it has only five people, A, B, C, D, E and A is a friend of B, and B is a friend of C, and D is a friend of E, right? So let's say I'm going to do A is a friend of B, so there's an edge between them when they're friend, B is a friend of C, so there's an edge between them, and D is a friend of E, all right? So if I draw this out, you can see that A, B, C form a connected component, D and E form a connected component. So of course, this is by me through visual inspection, so how can I do that in the computer is we're going to use union find to check whether one friend is connected to another friend in a direct or indirect way. Okay, so basically we can de determine through union find data structure, there's a two different disconnected subsets, ABC form a set, D and E form a set, and they are uh, not connected from one another. Okay, so essentially the type of operation is in terms of union, A of B is to say, I would like to connect A with B in the social network example. And I have an operation here. I want to find pass CD is to find if there is a pass connecting to element from C and D. In order to achieve this sort of analysis task, the underlying data structure is basically union find. All right. So what I would like to go into detail, um, we'll see how much we go, is what is the detail underneath union find, right? So whenever, remember I said, union is to connect to object and find is to say, if there's a path connecting this to object. So an example here is to say, I have this very complicated collection of trees or graphs. I want to see if those two nodes are actually connected. Right? So is there a pass between them? The underlying data structure is union find. So first of all, before we do that, let's first talk about how to store a tree in a linear array. Okay, So in this case, I have two tree, left tree and right tree, one slightly bigger than the other. Um, and I have some arbitrary ordering of the nodes. So how do I store this in a linear array in a computer? The way you do it is you kind of start with some node and you look at the pointers. And what we have is we introduce pointer to its parents, okay? So let's look at the right tree and I will let you practice with the left tree. This is right tree, the root node is 15. So the yellow, okay? So remember it's an arbitrary order. So basically I'm ordered all the nodes from left to right using their index. So, you know, this, remember this whole thing, this union of those two things is my data. So I have label on my vertices going from zero to 15 or zero to 16, but I'm going to see what happened to part of this graph or part of this uh, collection of trees. So I have 15 and it's, it's children three is a one point to it. This corresponds to this particular edge. And then we also know 14 is pointing to three. That is this edge. Two is also pointed to three. So I have two point to three. And then four is pointed to two. And then five is pointed to four. 
All right. So this is an example how you actually store a tree in a linear array. You just, you know, uh, you know, of course, in this case, I'm deciding to always use the child node to point to its parent node, immediate parent node. But I can do the other way around. I can start with the parent node and point it to uh, uh, the child node. However, in this case, it's, it's actually better because for every single node, it has a unique parent. So your a pointer is pointing to your parent. Okay, so this is how you store a tree uh, in the linear array. So I'm going to end my lecture today here is to for you to understand it. If I give you a linear array like this, can you recover the three disjoint trees or disjoint sets from this storage, right? Of course, this is slightly different where I also added a self pointer to its root. So so any of those uh, root node of the tree has a self pointer. So because there are three trees, there is a three root in this. But you can trace the pointers as what I just did earlier to recover those three trees, which is stored in the exactly same array. Okay. So now if you have this kind of storage, your operation like union and find makes sense can be all implemented on top of this. Okay, so this is one of the few data structure I'm going to spend some time describing because it really tells you if I want to recover homology, especially zero dimensional homology, which is connected components, if I want to check connectivity of my underlying data, this is a data structure to use. Okay, it's also a data structure that is behind, for example, computing merge tree, which is a topological structure used a lot in both data analysis and visualization. So that's that. I am going to stop the stream.